Okay. Good evening, everyone. Welcome, welcome um, to our first training event of the academic year. I'm Julie Tenniel, Project Director for EPIC. I want to give a special shout out to our 2023-2024 cohort. We are thrilled to pull you deeper into the power of integrated care and interprofessional events like this one. There's lots of excitement about tonight's webinar on narratives, poetry, and mural making, how creative approaches can enhance our practice. And as always, I'd like to thank members of our EPIC team here tonight, including Wendy Myers, our grant program coordinator, and Sarah Franciotti, our research assistant. So some important information about tonight's event. First, your video and microphone are automatically off since this is a webinar. You can enter questions for the presenters in the Q&A box, but the presenters would prefer to hang until 7.40 when we do sort of a more formal kind of question and answer time. So just hold on to those questions, jot them down, and you can ent enter them into the Q&A box toward the end. Second, log in with your full name for attendance credit. If you need to change your name, you can do that by clicking on the three dots that are in the upper right-hand corner of your personal window. So you can change the um, name in your, um, in your Zoom square by doing that. And then finally, please listen closely to what I'm about to say. If you want CEUs or a certificate of attendance, you're required to attend the entire training and complete a certificate request form while this event is still live, and that'll be just before eight o'clock tonight. The link for CEUs or a certificate of attendance will be available at the end of the post-test. And also just a reminder that the goal of this research and training grant is to expand the numbers of well-trained MSW, MED school counseling, and PsyD professionals working with children, adolescents, and transitional aged youth in high need and um, high demand areas. So I'm gonna forward this slide. So at this point, we want you to scan the QR code that you see in front of you, or click on the link in the chat to complete the pretest. And we're gonna give you about three or four minutes to do that. So I'm gonna mute myself again, and then I'll introduce our speakers for tonight. Okay, so I am gonna stop sharing at this point since we're at a good number of pretests. And I'm gonna turn this over to Dr. Megan and Jane Golden and Nick Mazza. Hope you're pronouncing names right. Um, and they're gonna share slides and get started and they will more fully introduce themselves at the outset of their presentation. Also, I want you to note that we have more detailed biographical information about these amazing people on our EPIC website. We are grateful to you and we look forward to your presentation. Hi, everyone. It's great to be here with you all tonight. Um, so we're just going to start off by each briefly introducing ourselves. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Dr. Megan Corredo. I'm a doctor of social work, a licensed clinical social worker. I'm also an assistant professor in the Master's of Social Work program at Westchester University. Um, I do a lot of different things. Um, so I've been a trauma clinician working with kids and teenagers who've experienced various forms of trauma and adversity, worked in a lot of different settings. As you all know, for many of us as social workers, we are um, working multiple jobs. Sometimes it's because of the pay. Sometimes it's because we just want to make life a little bit more interesting. So I've often had um, multiple jobs in multiple settings at the same time. So I worked in schools, homes, residential treatment facilities, hospitals, um, community-based work as well. And uh, I also like to share with people. So I, I specialize in work with people who've experienced trauma and I myself am also a survivor of complex trauma. And I actually use the arts to help me navigate uh, my own trauma as well. So I, uh, I like to dibble and dabble in a lot of different creative methods, um, including alcohol ink, if you haven't looked it up before, it's so fun to play. Um, resin, uh, collage, mosaic. Um, so all these different art forms have kind of helped me to um, navigate my own traumas. 
And then I'm also the creator of the Stories Trauma Narrative Intervention, which we're going to talk about a little bit today, which helps kids kind of look back on their past experiences, positive and negative, organize them, and then use creativity and the arts to help them um, innovatively express their experiences and then figure out in light of all the di that I've been through, where do I see myself going from here? So that's a little bit about me, and you're going to get to know a little bit about um, each of our work today in more depth, as well as we share our presentations with you. Dr. Nick, you want to introduce yourself next? Make sure you unmute yourself. We can't hear you. Hi, I'm, I'm Nick Mass, and uh, uh, my background is I'm a retired uh, dean and faculty member at uh, Florida State uh, College of Social Work. But prior to that and during that, uh, I was uh, I stayed involved in a lot of clinical work. And uh, in Florida, I didn't know who would win the battle when they were coming up with licensure. So uh, I uh, got licensed in psychology, social work, and marriage and family therapy. You, you only need one. Um, but I've been involved in poetry therapy since 1972. And, you know, I was only five at the time, you know. But but uh, mm -hmm. uh, so I've been involved with that uh, quite a bit and. Uh, uh, currently serve as president, and uh, uh, and I edit the Journal of Poetry Therapy, uh, which has uh, been around since 1987. Uh, so it's really a, a, a pleasure. To, I feel fortunate to be involved in some of the things uh, I, I am uh, involved with, and uh, hopefully we'll talk more about uh, you know our practice and how we you know integrate uh, all this. Uh, uh, one thing, just a little quick side note, is that uh, my undergraduate degree is in English, and uh, you know, and took some criticism or questioning of why would you get a degree in English, uh, especially when I got into social work. And I said, well, you know, you study the human condition in English, and you do something about it in social work. So it's uh, it served me well, uh, and uh, I guess I'll stop uh, at this point. And Jane. Oh, thank you, Megan, and thank you, Dr. Nick. Um, so I'm honored to be here tonight with both of you. And so um, I run the mural arts program for the city of Philadelphia, and it's a job I feel very honored and privileged to be doing. Uh, I believe really deeply in what art can do. Um, I was an artist. I started painting when I was young. I went to college in California, went to Stanford, was a double major political science and fine art. I was an artist who thought I'd go to law school. I moved down to LA and saw these extraordinary murals everywhere. And I was like, oh my goodness, what if I could do a mural? And I had um, parents who really talked a lot about the murals in this country during the 1930s. And so I was really taken by what I saw, very inspired. And I had this opportunity to apply for a tiny grant from the city of LA. It was a $300 grant to do the wall that was 20 feet high and 100 feet long. <laughs> And I ended up, because I think I drove the city crazy, I called them every day for months and months, I ended up getting this little grant, and I, I realized I had never really done a mural, so I wasn't sure what I was doing, but um, I had really good colleagues, and we did this mural in Santa Monica, which was so, um, the process was so inspiring, uh, because I used to think like that everybody should have art in their life, but I didn't really understand what it meant till I stood on that street corner at Ocean Park in Maine. And I realized that art is like oxygen and it's a matter of equity. And that I love galleries and museums, but I don't think they belong exclusively behind those walls. I then painted murals for a number of years in Los Angeles. I got very sick, I have lupus. I came back East to be with my family and I was coming up to Philly to a hospital here, Hahnemann Hospital. And every time I came up, I'd read about Philadelphia had a new mayor. Philadelphia had its first black mayor. It was hugely exciting. Philadelphia had a new mayor who was starting an anti-graffiti network. And I read in one of the articles that he was going to have an art component to work with the graffiti writers. And I applied for this job. And by some strange chance, I got it, got this job to run a little art component for the Philadelphia Anti-Graffiti Network. And I worked with graffiti writers for all these years and I saw amazing talent and what young people didn't have were opportunities and the world is not fair that way. And um, I was able to like learn so much from community organizers and leaders and from young people 
And uh, those years, it was like getting three graduate degrees in how you work fairly and respectfully in communities. And then I went back and I got my Master of Fine Arts in Painting. And uh, in 1997, my former boss of anti-graffiti passed away. They shut down anti-graffiti. And I went to the new mayor, Ed Rendell, and I asked if he would create a community-based public art program. And to my utter shock, um, he said that he was open to the idea. And he said, well, come up with a name. <laughs> so my colleagues and I went, the Vero Arts Program. And he was like, Jane Golden, you're in charge. I'm like, oh. <laughs> I've never been in charge of anything. And so um, through a lot of tenacity and grit and perseverance and inspired by the power of art, mural arts was created. And in some way, we never looked back. And all these years later, we're uh, just making sure every citizen has access to art and beauty. I'm excited for our discussion today. Um, we all kind of represent all these different art forms um, and all each have our own story and how we kind of came to the space in the field as well. So just to give everybody um, an overview of our presentation tonight, um, we're going to start off with a discussion. Um, we have a question or a couple of questions that we're going to kind of um, uh, explore collectively together. And then each of us as presenters is going to share a little bit um, more formally about the work that we do. Um, I'm going to share about my work first, then Jane will be sharing her work, and then Dr. Nick um, as well. And then after we've shared uh, formally a little bit more about what we do, then we're also going to engage in brief discussion with each other. We identified some key questions. And what I love about what we did when we um, were thinking about how we wanted to structure today's presentation is it was very collaborative, which is also um, something that we want to talk about and explore and something that the EPIC program is already exploring. How do we um, foster all these different types of collaboration so that we can each play to each other's strengths and also learn from each other? And then um, at the end, we're going to take a look at some of the questions that you all have and then provide some feedback, some answers, um, or we might even just provide more questions in response to your questions. Um, but you'll also have an opportunity to be able to interact with us a little bit through the Q&A. Now, um, you can feel free as questions arise, you can feel free to put them in the Q&A um, area of Zoom. However, we're not going to look at them until we get to the Q&A portion, just so you're aware. All right, so let's go ahead and get started talking about this first question. Um, and uh, Jane and Dr. Nick, we can kind of like weigh in uh, in whatever way makes the most sense for us. So why are the arts important, especially in work with marginalized, traumatized populations? Well, I think um, what the arts do is I think that there are two things I've seen. One is it creates a safe space and it's a space where people feel free to be themselves and not judged. Uh, also, I think number two, actually, there are three things. Three, it, it also, people seem to feel a sense, even if they're not working directly in a group, like collaboratively, although we, oh, we often work that way, there's something about being connected to the larger world that fights against that feeling of isolation. And the third thing that I think is most important is that in a way the arts tap into people's potential and that the loop that is played that often gets played in people's heads is that they're a failure, that they can't achieve, that they, that it's like, I can't, it's like negative. And so in a way they're able to, finish something, to hang something up, to be part of a work of public art, it's like, oh, wait a minute, I can do this. And it helps build resilience. And uh, like belief in self is so important if we're going to move forward. And so I think the arts do those things. Mute, you're, you're muted. <laughs> I still couldn't agree more <laughs> uh, that especially in this time when there's so much, uh, you know, uh, uh, going on with, uh, you know, some of the tragedies that are that are going on, uh, whether you're talking about uh, uh, mass shootings, war, uh, violence, uh, uh, you know, on, on and on. And we're seeing that, uh, you know, there's a natural response to the arts to be able to 
uh, create as a way of, uh, of empowerment, uh, as a way of uh, survival, as a way of getting the word out, uh, you know, to uh, uh, the word, the action, you know, uh, uh, to others uh, in a sense of uh, uh, validating, you know, what's going on and uh, uh, providing the means uh, to, uh, to do that. And I think there's, uh, you know, a common thread, uh, whether it's poetry, art, dance, uh, drama, or, you know, uh, and, and so on, of, uh, of how we uh, are able to, to connect with people uh, and vulnerable, you know, particularly vulnerable uh, populations. Uh, so it's, uh, um, th there's, there's no doubt, again, from my small part of the world, uh, just look at, uh, uh, from poetry standpoint, just look at Amanda Gorman. Uh, what, uh, you know, what she did, she did more to validate poetry than, you know, many of us could. Uh, and of course, you know, I come from Florida. Uh, so, uh, uh, of course, she was, uh, uh, her work was banned in the, in the school systems. Uh, so now more than ever. And then I would add, I'm thinking of three different things in response to this question. So one of them, marginalized populations have already had so, have already been disempowered in so many different ways on so many different levels at the hands of so many different systems. And um, I believe the help that, that, uh, that the arts help to um, give us our power back. Um, some of the things that I have seen and heard and witnessed people create, um, even if it's something that's not performed on a stage, even if it's something that uh, doesn't win an award, it's not, it's not recorded, it's not televised, but when people have that ability to kind of um, express their raw, authentic emotions through the arts, um, it gives them a sense of power and feeding off of what Jane mentioned, um, like a, a sense of self-efficacy, um, a sense of, of purpose and a sense of pride. I think it also helps us to experiment with new identities. Um, so life can be so serious and uh, it's difficult for us to engage in creative play, especially as adults. Um, I think it's a little bit more uh, permissible in childhood because we think about, you know, how, how kids and teenagers express themselves um, non-verbally. But um. Oftentimes, like our our roles in society are very like fixed and rigid, but when we're experimenting with different artistic forms, we can adopt new and different identities. We can engage in creative play in a way that we can't always do in real life. Um, I'm thinking about kids that I worked with in a middle school in Southwest Philadelphia that has since closed down, and um, I worked I worked with the kids who. Uh, the kids that I work with all had a bad rap, and many of them were uh, engaging in acts of aggression. At that particular time, they were also on the news. Um, I would watch news stories and be like, that's my clients. Um, just doing different things, aggressive things in the neighborhood, and the community. They had experienced a ton of trauma, and then they were reenacting that trauma out on other members of the community as well, um, partially because nobody taught them alternative ways of kind of taking those emotions and channeling them into something else but um the kids that I worked with were always pegged as as being the bad kids as being the problem kids and uh I had just learned how to create mosaics and uh whatever I have learned in my artistic exploration I've introduced it to clients um therapeutically clinically and I I said you know what let's do let's do uh mosaics in our group therapy and everyone was like, are you sure? You sure you want them to have glass? Like they have glass cutters. Like, do you know what the kids are doing? I'm like, yeah, I know what the kids are doing. We're going to set boundaries. We're going to set, you know, uh, guidelines. And they were so excited about it. So I remember I actually took each of the pieces, the mosaic pieces home. I drove them to each person's home because I'm like, if something happens to these pieces while someone is on the bus, on their way home, that's going to be on the news too. I said, nope, I'm going to drop it off with the caregivers. So I dropped each of the pieces off to the caregivers once they were finished. And like the look in the caregivers' faces, they were like, someone so made this? And I'm like, yeah. Like it was just, even for their caregivers who had also kind of labeled kids as being problematic um, 
in all these different ways, were able to also see a different side of their child as well, which was um, which was really amazing to be a part of. Then I would also say that um, the arts really help us speak in ways that we can't express with words. And there's some things that, uh, there's a lot of injustice. There's a lot of oppression. Um, there's so many painful things that happen, particularly to marginalized communities. And uh, for whatever reason, sometimes when we speak directly about those injustices, using only language without a creative form, um, people people don't ne necessarily listen to it uh, to the extent that they do when we incorporate creative methods as well. So I feel like the arts help us to break through some of these walls, um, <laughs> some of the concrete, some of the bricks that words cannot. I think of um, like even, you know, television shows, movies, uh, art exhibits, um, and how using this creative method as a tool can help open up doors that were previously closed to marginalized communities as well. And Megan, if I could just quickly uh, yeah. bounce off that, is, is that uh, uh, a creative program for at-risk uh, or underserved middle school uh, uh, students and some of the same uh, issues, you know, we range transportation because we know it'll be hard, you know, to, to come to us. But one of the things I, you know, we all learn from our clients, our students, and and uh, so I'm thinking, you know, I'm teaching them how to do poetry and I want to get them to, it's called a group poem, to perform. And so I asked for about, I didn't have to do a thing. They just naturally, you know, got into that. And it was just, uh, you know, so empowering. And again, I, I learned the same thing. I work with some people in dance and uh, I said, you know, what you're doing in dance, that is the poem. Uh, I, I couldn't begin to capture that. So again, combined, we, we see how the arts is just uh, so powerful. Yeah. Oh, just like two things, Megan, you made me re th remember this. I have this image in my head when I first started working for anti-graffiti, I decided after I saw the drawings in the black books, the kids had that they were, they were so amazing. These drawings, I thought, Oh, we'll have like life drawing. We're going to at this community center in West Philly. And so like all these big graffiti writers, like tan knife, like cornbread. And they, they were, they were drawing from a bowl, a bowl of fruit. I couldn't believe it. I had this fruit, little fruit set up. And I invited the mayor to come by one night because it was always good attendance. I always had great attendance. And he walked in there and he said, Jane Golden, he never called me Jane, Jane Golden. If I didn't see this with my eyes, I wouldn't believe it. Because there they were just so intently drawing that fruit. And in between breaks, they would talk about graffiti this and all the graffiti dramas. And I'd be like, oh, my God. Oh, wow. Listen to this. Listen to that. I always felt like an anthropologist studying graffiti. And so but it was just amazing. And the same thing happened when we started working at the state prison that you felt when we would bring our uh, visitors out there. People say, oh, I feel like I'm in a think tank. It is interesting. Like, I forget that I'm, I'm, I'm in a prison when I'm, I'm involved in such sophisticated discourse. So thank you for, for for inspiring those two memories. Yeah. <laughs> That's really interesting to think about that the arts too can help us to transcend our current circumstances. That's no matter how stressful or confining those circumstances might be. And the thing is with kids, you know, they're natural uh, poets and performers and artists, uh, uh, you know, and, and, and until we until we kill it. I mean, if that's what happens. So, so uh, yeah, it's it's powerful. <laughs> I know we're all preaching to the choir here, but but uh, it really is the uh, the examples that you are given is uh, uh, hits home. So let's segue into the next part of our presentation tonight. So I'm going to begin by sharing about my work um, relating to creativity and narratives. Um, then Jane is going to share um, about mural making, and then uh, Dr. Nick is going to talk to us about poetry, and then we'll come back to kind of this dialogue with one another um, again after we've gone through each of the presentations. And I have to apologize in advance. If you all hear any strange noises, it is my dog. Right before I did the presentation, I confiscated her squeaky toys because I said, who wants to hear that? <laughs> all right. 
So I told you all before that um, I developed an intervention called the Stories Trauma Narrative Intervention. And tonight I'm going to talk to you all about four key questions. First, how does trauma affect our stories? Then how can stories help us navigate trauma? What is a trauma narrative and why is creativity an important part of, of our trauma narratives? So first, how does trauma affect our stories? Um, there's so many different ways that trauma impacts our stories. Um, so people who've experienced trauma often describe the self as being shattered or broken. Let's say that you have a glass or a vase and it breaks into a million tiny pieces. Even if you were able to find and recover each and every one of those pieces and put them back together again, that glass, that vase has elementally been changed. And trauma impacts us in the same way. And actually feelings of brokenness are actually a normal response to trauma. This thing happens. This thing that wasn't supposed to happen um, kind of crashes into our world. And then we're left with the pieces to decide what are we going to do with them next? Also, it's important to note that fragmentation actually naturally occurs in the brain, just on the basis of the brain structure. Um, fragmentation, it can be harmful. Um, and it all can also can be disorienting when it's overused, but it's also a really helpful survival mechanism that can help us navigate um, difficult life circumstances as well. So this is something that's really important to keep in mind and why um, I would encourage any of you all who are trying to figure out how, how you are going to justify arts-based strategies to funders, to managers, to supervisors, to familiarize yourself with um, the couple things that I'm going to speak to. For whatever reason, um, I mean, it, it's a good thing that we have scientific and neurobiological proof for some of the things that we know. Uh, but then also, you know, sometimes it's like, okay, we know this, do I really have to prove this? But um, the arts really help us to connect the verbal and the nonverbal hemispheres of the brain. So when we experience trauma, um, let me back up. There's a bundle of nerve fibers that connect the verbal and the nonverbal parts of our brain. And that bundle of nerve fibers is called the corpus callosum. When we experience trauma, however, the corpus callosum has difficulty um, facilitating the communication between our verbal and our nonverbal parts of our brain. So we have these very real memories, but they're fragmented. And that corpus callosum is not able to do its job to be able to help us um, connect those very real experiences with the words to be able to describe things, which is why narratives, uh, the development of narratives is incredibly important in helping to build those links. And also why creativity in general is important because sometimes we can't find the words to be able to coherently in an organized manner, um, be able to express and describe the things that we've been through. Um, as I just mentioned, when people experience trauma, the corpus callosum cannot facilitate communication between the two hemispheres the way that it ordinarily could. This makes it difficult for people to find the words to be able to explain their experiences. Um, another thing y'all didn't know you were going to have like a little mini neuroscience lesson tonight. Um, so another thing to keep in mind is that the brain is uh, can be divided into three major parts. There's the brain stem, which is in charge of basic life functions, eating, breathing, um, hunger, using the bathroom. There's our limbic system, which is in charge of our fight or flight response. It gets us moving, make sure that we're able to navigate danger. And then there's the cerebral cortex, which is the part of the brain that we're talking about when we're talking about rational thought. Like I'm weighing the pros and cons. I'm thinking about what I'm, you know, um, what I just experienced. Another thing is that when we experience trauma or when our trauma is triggered, this part of the brain, the limbic system is what's lit up. And the limbic system's job is just to make sure that we're able to survive danger. Its job is not to say, oh, what happened to me today? Let me weigh, you know, let me understand what happened in light of all the other experiences that I've had in my life. Let me understand um, how this experience fits within the greater context of my narrative. That's not that's not the limbic system's job. Um, the limbic system doesn't have the luxury to go into all that detail because it's just getting us moving. Um. And actually, you can look this up. There's MRI brain scans that show when this part of the brain is lit up, not much is happening here. And this is the part of the brain where we're like engaging in conscious processing about our experiences. So oftentimes people may come to us trying to articulate somehow what they have gone through as it relates to their trauma. And it's coming out as bits and pieces of things 
not necessarily because the person doesn't want to communicate with us or the person doesn't trust us. I mean, sometimes it could be that we always want to leave that as a, as a possibility, but oftentimes it's because, uh, the, the brain at the time of the trauma didn't have the luxury to be able to say what happened first, second, third. How do I verbally articulate this? So it's coming out to us as bits and pieces of things, which is also why narratives and creativity as a whole can help to fill that gap because the person has those very real experiences, but they haven't necessarily been processed by their cerebral cortex. And if you haven't processed things here, how can you like feel like you have some type of control or you feel like you can um you know overcome the things that you've gone through if all the things that you've gone through are just kind of like bits and pieces that are all over the place that you haven't fully processed um so how can stories help us to navigate trauma um there are so many different reasons why stories and creativity as a whole can help us navigate trauma so first, stories help us transition from a place of fragmentation and chaos to a place of order and organization. And I'm going to talk to you briefly about my stories process, how, um, how it helps people kind of take all of these different broken pieces, say, okay, how do I want to organize them? Um, how do I want to explore each of these pieces? And how do I want to put them back together again in a way that is meaningful and in a way that helps me also to think about what I see for myself in the future? So the very act of help, helping people tell their narratives is helping them transition from this place of fragmentation to a place of order. Um, uh, for, for most of you who have gone through an educational program, at some point in time, you had to write a paper. And uh, oftentimes, I don't know about your papers, but for me, some of my papers started off in a place of chaos. Um, I have all of these books. I have articles. I have, um, I don't know, uh, uh, all these different sources of information, and they're just kind of chaotic and random. But the the process of writing the paper through that process, I'm able to take those bits and pieces of information, figure out where each of them fit. And then I can look back and say, based off of the things that I have seen, based off of the things that I have learned, um, this is what I'm going to, this is how I'm going to package it to share with other people. Um, and in the same way, helping people tell their narratives helps them to take those different pieces, the pieces of pain, the pieces of adversity, the pieces of strength, the pieces of resilience to be able to say, okay, how do I want to put these things together? What do what do these experiences mean? And then what do I want to do with them next? Um, so as I mentioned uh, in the in my explanation of the three major parts of the brain, after we've experienced trauma, our stories are fragmented. They're also disorganized. Our thoughts, our feelings, our memories are all over the place. But as we look at each piece of our story, slowly but surely, we can put the pieces of the puzzle together a little bit at a time. And then once we've kind of put the puzzle together, um, we can also consider what we want for ourselves in the future. So we can ask ourselves questions like, in light of everything that I've been through, where do I want to go from here? Um, but we really need that storytelling process or other creative processes to help us um, to help us take that journey to get to that point. If you think about, um, I'm not a puzzle person. I have family members who are puzzle people who will do like a 10,000 piece puzzle. Um, but it's like, it's like you have all these puzzle pieces scattered all across the table. And then someone's like, oh, what do you think of the puzzle? Well, I don't know yet. Like I haven't organized it. I haven't put the pieces together. I don't even know what the whole picture is yet. But through that process of putting these pieces together, you're then able to kind of uh, see the vision and also formulate, you know, your own thoughts, feelings, opinions about what happened. And the storytelling process can do us uh, the same or similar things for us as well. So uh, through the stories trauma narrative process that I developed, this is kind of like a visual summary of what I'm leading um, people through the process of doing. And I'm very excited, very grateful. Uh, the stories intervention began as it's always hard for me to figure out where, where to say that it started. It started in my own trauma and it started in my own um, journey as a social worker as well, like kind of these parallel journeys. Um, but oftentimes, uh, you know, I'm, I'm like wondering where did it start? Um, but throughout each of the story steps, 
The goal is to meet people where they are, which is often in a, in a place of fragmentation where their thoughts, their feelings, their memories are scattered and disorganized. Then you help them to create a timeline where they name and they sequence events, positive and negative. Uh, because if we're only having people tell the, uh, the story of the trauma, we're only having them tell half the story. There's also another story of strength, resilience, survival that we also wanna make space for. Then they're detailing their trauma narrative in whatever creative format makes the most sense for them. It can be speaking, it can be writing, it can be through dance, music, sand tray, poetry. Um, but they're kind of looking at each of those pieces individually, looking at what happened, what they were thinking, what they were feeling. They do this a little bit at a time at a pace that feels comfortable for them. And then once they've done, done that, they put all these pieces together so that they've integrated their narrative. They're um, uh, putting, putting uh, the thoughts and feelings together and they're viewing their narrative as a cohesive whole. And then the story doesn't end with the last event that they detailed. The story ends with them developing their future vision because as long as we are living and breathing, our stories are not over. We always have the ability to make changes, um, to edit out characters, to add new ones, um, and also to develop new and different qualities in ourselves as well. So this is like a snapshot of the story's process. So um, I specialize in supporting people and telling their trauma narratives, but what is a trauma narrative? So this is my definition of a trauma narrative. Um, there are others um, as well, if you look in the literature. So I would say that a trauma narrative is a verbal or a nonverbal story that highlights both trauma and strength. It helps people reflect on the past and the present so that they can envision a more hopeful future, which is ultimately the goal. Um, I'm a big fan of interventions that not only help people process their pain, but also help them move through their pain to envision something new and different for themselves. Sometimes we get so stuck in uh, having people talk about the trauma, the trauma, the trauma. We think that that's the work. That's part of the work. The other part of the work is to help people um, figure out what they want for themselves moving forward and what's next for them. What's the next chapter? What's the sequel? Like, you know, how do we continue to move forward? Um, so the Stories Trauma Narrative Intervention, it provides a step-by-step -step process to support youth in telling their trauma narratives. And um, I'm very grateful to say that um, over 10,000 people have been trained across the different stories um, programs since, since its development. I never thought that it was going to be a uh, that it would develop this way. And I'm telling you all this too, because you might have a really innovative, creative idea and you never thought that it would develop and grow. Like go for it, um, reach out to supports, connect with people who are already in the field um, because as social workers, as helping professionals, we can also you know, develop things that like extend beyond our wildest imagination to be able to support the communities that we service. So a few things to remember if you're thinking about helping people tell their narratives. Sometimes the ending isn't happy. Um, we have to figure out how, how will we handle our own discomfort as helping professionals if the ending of the story isn't happy? Um, how do we make space for the gloom, the doom, the trauma, the harm, the pain, um, even when there isn't a clear resolution at the end? And also, how do we, how do we make space for hope? even if the ending isn't happy. Sometimes also there aren't he uh, clear heroes and villains. Uh, I could go on and on about this, I won't, but like th thinking about how we are societally, it is very easy for us to polarize. It's very easy, us, easy for us to say all or nothing. We have this, um, we don't leave a lot of room for gray. Um, we don't leave, a lot of room for ambiguity and in many people's stories, um, the hero and the villain, sometimes they're the same. Um, sometimes it's difficult to tell who is who. Also, sometimes the line between good and bad, whatever that means, is blurry. Um, we also wanna remember though, that as long as a person is living and breathing, their story isn't over. This is such a hopeful thing um, in our work with marginalized populations and people who've experienced trauma. Um, it's also, yeah, part of what part of what makes the the narrative process and this creative process so um, empowering for us as helping professionals too. There's always space for hope, 
And another thing to remember, for every story of trauma, there are also stories of strength and resilience. Now, we might have to dig for those stories of strength and resilience sometimes because the trauma like hits us in our face. Um, but it's important for us to train our eyes to also see the strength because it is there. So why is creativity an important part of trauma narratives? Um, well, we, we talked about this briefly just in our conversation um, together at the beginning of the presentation, but it's incredibly helpful in overcoming some of the barriers that people may face when they're attempting to tell their stories with words. And we talked briefly about why neurobiologically people have trouble being able to verbally articulate um, the details of their trauma after they, you know, they've experienced uh, a difficult experience. When we incorporate creative methods, we are uh, making space for the things that we don't have the words to be able to express. Um, also, it's important for us to remember everybody expresses themselves differently. So oftentimes we learn about these, these interventions that are based in, in words, that are based in language, and there's nothing wrong with that. However, it's important for us to note and remember that everything is not for everyone. And what works for one person may not work for another person. So it's really important for us to have multiple options to be able to present to people um, if and when these, these interventions, these approaches that we're introducing um, that are you know, highly based in, in language, if they're not working for us to be able to present other options. And also, Trauma is like this multi-sensory experience. It impacts, you know, the things that we have seen, the things that we feel tactilely, um, smell, sounds, and the arts actually do that for us as well. Um, sometimes if we're only using language, we're not fully engaging the senses. The trauma has fully engaged the senses, but some of our interventions are not necessarily fully engaging the senses. When you are creating, um, and, and also I wanna emphasize that narratives come in a lot of different formats. It's not just written, it's not just spoken. Um, you know, a narrative can be a dance, narrative can be music, narrative can be a mural. Um, but the more of our senses that we're able to engage in the healing process, the more fully we're able to explore each angle of our story. All right, so I'm gonna pass the baton to Jane. Thank you very much, that was wonderful. So Megan, do you have my presentation? Are you gonna? Okay, great. So, um, so I'm gonna sort of take everyone through the different components of mural arts and talk about um, why I think it's important, how I think we're moving the needle and how we center art in our practice. So our responsibility is to make sure that everyone everywhere has access to public art, but also opportunities in the arts. And that means that we work with a wide uh, variety of people of all ages across the city. Um, we are a program that is highly uh, aspirational and believe deeply in the arts, but we're also very practical. And so we're any issue that's on the desk of the mayor, city council, uh, department heads are, are issues that we're thinking deeply about. Next. And so uh, we believe that art can bring about change. Um, that change can happen in individuals, in communities. And by extension, I think there is a huge impact on the city of Philadelphia. We have well over 4,200 works of art that grace the sides of buildings in Philadelphia. A larger, it's a, the largest collection of its kind anywhere. And I think what's interesting is that this is work that really is resonant with the citizens. I think one of the things I learned uh, at Anti-Graffiti was how you how you go into a neighborhood acknowledging that you don't have answers and you should go in with questions and realizing that this is someone's home. And so we always went in with the question, you know, what would you like? Um, and that open-ended question uh, just led to so much conversation about people's memories, history, stories. I often think of our collection as the autobiography of the city of Philadelphia. And it's because it's very much not art that comes down from the sky and lands from Mars. It's art that is created in careful, deliberate, uh, respectful collaboration with people. Um, and so people start to believe because they see themselves on walls throughout the city. 
And over and over again, back in the early days, people would say, well, I, when I go to, either I never go to the Museum of Art, or if I go there, I don't see anyone who looks like me. And suddenly on these two to three story, four story walls around the city, there were people that look like them and that respected their lives. And I felt it's like putting a stake in the ground and saying, um, this is mine, like holding up a mirror and saying that your life has meaning. And just a snapshot of mural arts, um, we have, um, I'll go into different programs in a minute, but uh, our budget is, you know, 14 million, 30%, 35% comes from the city, the rest we raise. We um, employ tons of artists every year and pay them. Everyone gets paid, middle school kids on up. Uh, we have a very low recidivism rate in our reentry program. We invest deeply in the creative economy. 25,000 people are involved in our programs every year. And then Color Me Back is one of our uh, same, it's a same day work program for people grappling with housing insecurity. And we pay people, we bring in career links, social services. Um, people are transforming the concourse while they themselves are getting transformed. And we do about 140 public art projects every year. So we're busy bees. And here are our, um, our different departments. So we have our porch light program and that's of particular interest tonight because that's our par partnership with the Department of Behavioral Health and Intellectual Disability Services. And, you know, when we started working with that department, this is back in 2007, the commissioner then, Dr. Arthur Evans said, you know, we send uh, bureaucrats into neighborhoods, they knock on doors and say, hey, we're here from the city, we're here to help you. And people say, well, actually I've received no services or bad services, so I really don't trust you. And he said in the field, there's a black box, he used to call it way of working. And he felt that what art did was it made people feel safer. And you heard Dr. Nick and, and Megan talk about all the things that art does and he believed it. And so he tested it, uh, he tested it out. And we started doing one project after the next, after the next and partnering with the department, we're not, you know, therapists and we're not our therapists, but we can partner with clinicians and social workers and therapists. And that way we're able to augment and shine a light on the work in a deeper way. Restorative justice, too many people are incarcerated in this country. We have to think of alternatives. So we work at the state prison, the county jail, and we have a big program called the Guild for People Coming Home. Uh, public art and civic engagement. Here we work with theater artists or writers or poets or dancers um, and painters, of course, but we do big complicated works of public art and many murals throughout the city, environmental justice. Um, you know, we feel that people in uh, communities, black and brown communities are disproportionately impacted by environmental bads, I'm going to call them. And so how is, is art become, how does art become a tool of advocacy and awareness building? In art education, we serve about 2,000 young people every year, range, ranging in age from 11 to 18. These are serious, very rigorous programs. Um, and the kind of creativity that you see is sort of just, it's amazingly inspiring. And then the Mural Arts Institute, we're working in cities across the country and the world. And it's not about mural arts replicating itself. It's about knowledge sharing. And it's about thinking about the field of art and social practice, art and civic change. Next. And here I just, I, now I've highlighted a few projects. And so um, almost as a case study. So this was, we, we did a mosque and it's, this is uh, at uh, Germantown in Jefferson. And this was, we were called in to do this project right after September 11th. It's ironic, that's today. And the mosque felt like they were, they were facing all kinds of discrimination. And so we said, okay, so we partnered with an organization called Artwell. And because we always love to partner. And I loved what either Dr. Nick or Megan said talking about, I mean, not going it alone, because I think that it's important that we know, you know what you know, you have to know what you don't know. And by bringing people together, you're able to create a robust village to really bring about change. And so we started, we looked at this and we said, okay, we're going to have all kinds of programs. We're going to have people working together. We're going to engage the community. We're going to engage the naysayers. We're going to bring people to the table in difficult conversations and through creativity, we hope we can find a path out. And so can we go to the next slide? That's what it looks like now. And so you can see this is physically transformative, but it's also sort of psychologically transformative because if you were involved in this, it's like such a matter, it's such a point of pride and inspiration and such change that it sort of takes people's breath away. And people are like, well, I worked on this. I did this. And yes, you did it. 
you did it. And not only did you do this, but you were able to overcome whatever barriers that that were you were holding in your head to talk to your neighbor, to understand the mosque, to open the door, to come in and to try to work together to create beauty. And that has power. Next. And then in the Portslight program, we work with all kinds of agencies and we create space for people to do art activities, to work alone, and then to work as a team. And what it is, is healing. You know, Megan said uh, something that made me think about restorative justice. And the truth is when trauma happens, when crime happens, when, you know, something difficult happens, it's sort of like our narrative of who we are is upended, right? And how do we start to put Megan said that eloquently. How do we put the pieces back together? Well, art is a way of healing. It's like an unspoken language. I've seen it over and over again. When we did this project, we were working with people who were in some ways catatonic, who people who were not talking much. And the psychiatrist said, it's just that they, when they would walk in the classroom, they felt like I can't even believe what I'm seeing. So what is that magic? that something about art, there's, it's, you see, you drive around the city, you see these beautiful images, but it's almost what is not spoken. It's the, it's what is in between the words that has the real power. Next. And here we work with veterans struggling with PTSD. And so this is called, you know, keys to change, but it was also about coming home and what that meant. And so you can see the subtle camouflage in the bushes, and this is leading to a space, this house where they feel safe. And so, you know, this pathway up to the house meant a lot to all the, the stakeholders. So we're looking, you know, we work with an extraordinary group of artists who are gifted painters, but it's not just about being classically trained or having the gift to create something beautiful. I mean, clearly this artist can do that, but it's also having empathy, the ability to listen, the ability to respect, and the and the ability to create space for people to say, to put in their own two cents about what do they think about this? What would they like to see? And so people feel like they're not um, spoken over or disrespected, but they're actually really very much a part of the process. I always think that, you know, if you could do a diagram about every project and see what's beyond the walls, it would be just stunning. Next. And here we have, uh, a, this is a really important project, which is a tribute to the trans community. And we had, this came in on a waiting list a number of times, and we were finally able to find the resources to do this. And we worked with Morris Home, and they work with young people who are uh, struggling with different issues of, of trauma, related to trauma, who are in the trans community. And I th and they felt like heard, respected. They felt like this is just a really important marker of who we are. And so I was just thrilled that we were able to do this project. And every mural that you see around the city is the result of working with you know, different like schools, rec centers, agencies, businesses. It's there's like a huge, as I said, it's about 25,000 people every year involved in all the programs and all the community groups. Next. And we here, we, with the Portslade program, we also work a lot in Kensington. We have about 35 programs there. I mean, Kensington, as we all know, it's no secret. It is a complex part of our city. It's also a beautiful part of our city. And I think this work, it lets us see the struggle, but we also see the great hunger for beauty in art. And we're able to see people's sort of unending faith that things will turn around. So there's something sort of wonderful that um, this work lets us see in spite of the fact that people are struggling with so many different issues. And in Kensington, we we looked at Indiana Avenue. We worked with Impact Services. They were doing all kinds of work with people who were both on the corner selling drugs and people who were in the neighborhood. And we said, okay, everybody can contribute and everyone is going to contribute. And we're going to do, we're going to have programs. We're going to do these beautiful murals. We're going to work with a poet, Ursula Rucker, and we're going to have poems in English and Spanish. And it's going to go straight up Indiana Avenue. And it's going to be about your lives. And then we had this great dedication with spoken word and 30, 40 people participated. Every single person, Dr. Nick said, well, I'm not a poet. And they then they went ahead and they said something really beautiful and eloquent and amazing. Next. Here we have a close-up of that project on Indiana Avenue. And then we did a series with um, the Office of Immigrant Affairs. 
and the Asian American Pacific Islander group. And we've been, and that was when the Stop Asian Hate campaign was happening. And we often join with different campaigns and advocacy efforts around the city because we do feel that art is an important marker of who we are. And so we did, this was our first mural in the city and I hope you all get to see it. It's on the side of Hardina, which is also a fabulous Indonesian restaurant. And what's so interesting about this is over 200 people came to the dedication. And I think that that's another barometer of what art means is that the dedication, so we do about 150 dedications every year. Megan, I think you've come to some. They're hugely exciting and people are cheering and they're cheering because it's they're cheering beauty, but they're cheering that they're being represented in sort of a very profound way. And that is and just for me endlessly inspiring. Next. And here we have another, a recent mural that we did that's in the heart of Chinatown. Uh, this is by uh, a young artist, Gina Kim, Kim. And, you know, we, it's, it's like wonderful that we work with young artists, like older artists, emerging artists, established artists, and everybody in between. And I, we want people to know that in Philadelphia, artists are welcome. We, um, ideas are welcome and we see creativity everywhere. And again, you know, Gina worked with the elders, worked with young people and really took the pulse of what, how do people see Chinatown today? And that took all that content and put it into this mural. And so people look at it and they feel this sense of like, I am heard. Next. Oh, and so finally, I just want to say that, you know, I think that, um, that our, our impact goes far beyond the wall. And there's this saying that I really love by um, a this theology professor, Maureen O'Connell. And she says that social change begins when human beings try to make sense of their lives and defiantly refuse to accept the idea that nothing new is possible. See what creativity does, it, it reminds us that something new is possible. What this work does, it's about possibility and hope. Thank you. All right, Dr. Nick. Wow, those are tough acts to follow. <laughs> and, uh, uh, thank you. And Megan, if I if I may, uh, I probably will need to do that <clears throat> a screen share if you don't if you don't mind. Um, one of the things I <clears throat> excuse me wanted to just by way of introduction, uh, poetry therapy because uh, is the use of language, symbol and story in therapeutic, in educational, and in community building capacities. So in some cases, uh, what a person might, what I usually say is you, you need to be clear on your own professional role. If you stay within your own professional role and identity, you know, ethically, legally, you'll know what you can do. So for example, you know, a teacher may want to use a poem uh, uh, to teach a particular lesson, or maybe to give some example on, on empathy, and, uh, but she's not, or he's not, you know, doing therapy. Uh, same thing with writing exercise and, and, and so forth. So purpose is the key thing. The, the therapist uh, will be using therapy for a therapeutic purpose, whether it's to uh, uh, empowerment, to promote uh, self-disclosure, to promote uh, uh, group interaction uh, and, and, and so on. So it's important to have that uh, in mind. And uh, uh, there, there's a handout that we have here. I think we're gonna send that to you by uh, email as well. But I just wanna uh, highlight uh, some of the things that uh, I think uh, what I've tried to do you know, through the years is to integrate the different approaches people have used in poetry therapy. And I might add, poetry therapy really, uh, uh, to some degree, has uh, been developed from bibliotherapy, which is more the librarian tradition, you know, using particular stories and books, you know, for a purpose. But uh, so as far as, uh, uh, as I see it, is that uh, the model I developed, it's, it's uh, called the RES model. And, uh, could we, uh, I think we'll, we'll uh, slide down to the next page. We'll start uh, backwards. <laughs> okay, a uh, little further down. No use, I'll start with the Mary. Oh, okay. Uh, 
And so what you can uh, can do is to uh, uh, use a poem, again, with your purpose, maybe the client, patient you're, you're working with, and try and uh, think of, you know, what is it that I want to do with this person? Do I want to uh, promote self-disclosure? Do I want to just validate what the person might be a uh, 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 feeling? Uh, do I want to promote uh, or break resistance? Because, you know, many times it's just so hard to talk about yourself. So you ask a person to, we'll talk about the poem. Of course, we all know inevitably while you're talking about the poem, you all you are talking about yourself. And again, just a quick side note, when I first started this many years ago, I worked with a group of alcoholics and uh, they were they either saw me or they would go to jail, lose their job or lose their spouse. So they weren't exactly the most motivated people uh, in the world. And so I started, uh, you know, with the poem, I think it was Road Not Taken. And then before I know it, this now keep in mind, these are like longshoremen, construction workers, you know, uh, uh, that people you wouldn't stereotypically, you wouldn't associate. But so this guy takes out his wallet, pulls out a poem, goes, here, read this. Uh, and what it was, it was a poem his daughter had given to him, was Desderada. Uh, and, uh, and he said, you know, read it. So I said, well, I'll be glad to read it, but maybe you want to read it. Uh, and he did more to validate, you know, poetry than it would have taken me who knows how long. But lesson learned is don't assume anything about any population, any group. Uh, but anyway, uh, so the receptive part, meaning uh, re receptive, meaning respond to, you know, uh, 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 to the poem, or sometimes it's prescriptive, you're recommending a, a poem. And so uh, one of the, uh, I'm just going to try one, uh, is that, uh, and I know we're a large group, so they don't have time to do interactions. I mean, I hope we did, but so I'm just going to read it for you to, to think about. Uh, I worried, Mary Oliver. I worried a lot. Will the garden grow? Will the rivers flow in the right direction? Will the earth turn as it was taught? And if not, how shall I correct it? Was I right? Was I wrong? Will I be forgiven? Can I do better? Will I ever be able to sing? Even the sparrows can do it, and I am, well, hopeless. Is my eyesight fading, or am I just imagining it? Am I going to get rheumatism, lockjaw, dementia? Finally, I saw that worrying had come to nothing, gave it up, took my old body, and went out into the morning and sang. And so uh, uh, some of you may just want to think about, you know, your uh, your reaction uh, uh, to that. Then you have open-ended poems, like if I cast off this tattered coat, go free into the mighty sky, if I should find nothing there but a vast blue, echoless, ignorant, what then? So that is open-ended. There's no one right interpretation. It just allows you to think about risk, you know, anxiety. Uh, if you use a poem like Road Not Taken, you might talk about decision-making, you know, and every decision, in every choice involves a loss, blah, blah, blah. So those are things that, uh, uh, that could be helpful. Uh, now we can scroll back up. Uh, and so that's the receptive prescriptive uh, part. And then as we move up uh, to uh, what I call a little further up, good, great. Uh, it's the, uh, uh, the idea of using writing uh, you know, poetry or, or narrative. You could, you could use uh, different narratives. Uh, and what uh, Megan was talking about when I was uh, writing the last edition of my book on poetry therapy, I wanted to get more research uh, on, on writing and therapeutic value. And James Pennebaker has done a lot. But what I found is I went to some scientific studies by physicians and, uh, and found a lot that related to uh, brain activity is, is how writing uh, different forms uh, are uh, uh, healthy for your brain, br uh, bring uh, back a sense of, of control, validate, I mean, a whole series of things uh, that, uh, I mean, I, I speculated that was true, but there was actually hard research to support that. And even little things, uh, which uh, and now you think in schools, they're starting to do away with cursive writing. At least I think they are in a lot of, a lot of schools. And then there, there's research to support that actually cursive writing is much better uh, for you than, than print or type, you know, or printing in terms of what, it, uh, in terms of retaining 
uh, information in terms of learning, in terms of healing. So there are a lot of things that uh, 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 are supported by our clinical observations, by hard research. Uh, and so anyway, just a, a, a few, I don't want to go over my time, uh, a few techniques that uh, if we had time, we'd do them, but, but we don't. So some things that you could do in the expressive creative is use what I call little poetic stems or uh, sentence stems, if you knew me blank. See, if you start to give a little structure to the person you're working with, it helps them go along. Because a lot of people, you say, write a poem or write, go, no, I don't want to do that. Yeah. Uh, uh, I am most happy when, uh, uh, and again, you could break that down you know, into a couple of lines like, uh, I used to be blank, but now I'm blank. And so uh, those are things that uh, uh, can be helpful. Then another technique is, again, Megan, you were mentioning the, uh, the, the census. It's what I call a sensory poem. Uh, and so you take uh, anything, uh, hope, uh, frustration, you pick it. You know, what, what the person is, 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 is feeling. So it might be something like, uh, Hope is the color, blank. It sounds like, blank. It feels like, it tastes like, it smells like, it makes you want to, it makes you feel like doing something. So when you do that, and I've done it with groups, you know, where they could they could use that. And I, of course, an individual uh, uh, can do that uh, as, uh, as well. Uh, and so, uh, does that make sense to you? I guess I'll ask my my uh, fellow uh, presenters. But does does that make sense to you in terms of being able to uh, 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 to find? And you'd be surprised what you what you come up with. And you can use other uh, uh, techniques like uh, you know an acrostic. Uh, and again, I know it sounds a little gimmicky, a little but but sometimes it helps to, depending on the age and who. And I've worked with preschoolers to older adults. I mean, it's uh, and I've used a lot of these techniques. Uh, uh, it, it's all a matter of respecting the, you know, you know, respecting the client and uh, making sure that, that uh, it might might appeal to them. Uh, one uh, a technique that's not on here, but I thought was uh, uh, useful. You may have heard of this. Uh, it's uh, it's credited to Hemingway, but I'm not sure if it really is Hemingway. It's called a six word story. Uh, uh, for sale, baby shoes, never worn. And so I'm, I'm again not. So again, sometimes just those few words provide enough uh, concentration to allow the person to really get into what their experience and, and to think about it. And there's a funny one by Margaret Atwood that, that, that she wrote. Uh, you know, she's a, uh, a well-known uh, writer. And uh, now if I get this right, it was uh, wanted him, loved him, that wanted him, loved him, got him. I'm missing a word, and the final word was shit. Uh, you know, it, it was just because uh, it can be humorous uh, uh, too. Uh, uh, it, it's uh, so you, again, you 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 could do whatever you want with the six word stories from humorous, very serious, uh, 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 you know, uh, kinds of things uh, that. Uh, uh, are uh, are helpful. Uh, the final uh, we about two minutes left. Uh, the final area, and you, you could read this part. I'm going to do something a little different. Uh, it's symbolic ceremonial. That's the one part uh, that is often overlooked in poetry therapy. But what you what you do with with poems and uh, it could be very powerful in terms of symbols. I mean, we know about using metaphors, something to stand for something else. But, uh, and I also would say these areas I'm giving you, the receptive, prescriptive, expressive, creative, and now symbolic, ceremonial, they don't have to be used independently. One may lead to another. So you might share a poem, which leads a person to write something else, which could come back to something symbolic, ceremonial. And, uh, and this is something that takes time. So if you use it with a client, be respectful, give, give them as much time as they need. But I'll just uh, briefly... Uh, explain it, is that uh, what you do is you, and I've done this again with all ages, particularly the uh, uh, the middle schoolers, is uh, take a piece of paper, put your hand on it, 
draw an outline of your hand. You know, it's all of the fingers on, on your hand. Now, I so said, I'd like you to think of a person who's very special in your life. That person could be uh, could be deceased, you know, could pass away or could be living, but someone who has had a real uh, influence, positive, positive uh, influence on you. And so think of that person. Then what I'd like you to, th uh, to do is on each finger, write a word or, or more of what he or she has given you. And if you prefer, you want to draw a little picture on each finger, that, that's fine too. And so if I'm working, you know, with a group, again, I allow them to take as much time as they want. And then it's open to if they want to share it uh, or not. And so uh, and I found that's been a very powerful uh, a technique. So what they could do with that hand, uh, and most want, if you're in a group, most do want to share it, uh, is they could think of a way of what, what do you want to do with what you just created? Do you want to share it with that person, if, if you can? Uh, what would be important symbolically? Some may want to bury it somewhere. They may want to, and again, in a respectful way, burn it. And you have to be real sensitive to culture, religion, all those things about what works with them. So that's a, uh, that's a way uh, that uh, you would use the uh, uh, a symbolic uh, ceremonial uh, a piece. So those, those things... Uh, 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 you know, fit together. Uh, I think in a in a, in a very uh, uh, helpful way. And that, in a nutshell, <laughs> that's uh, that's uh, uh, that's poetry therapy. That those are the primary components of poetry therapy. So uh, I'll stop at, at this point and uh, uh, say, uh, feel free to use it. And if uh, a quick commercial, if you want to learn more about poetry therapy, there is a website that you can go, go on poetrytherapy.org and it's on your handout. All right, so now we're gonna engage in some more discussion collectively. Um, and then after we have engaged in discussion together um, as, as panelists, then we are going to uh, take a look at the question and answer um, box and see you know, what we wanna, uh, what questions you all have. All right, so this first question is, how can people get started with using the arts in their practice? Well, I think first one thing is that um, if you're interested in this, I would think about different arts organizations who are putting art to work that you might want to intern with, get to know, read about. And then I think, um, there are ways to sort of to introduce it slowly. So I'd say like at the Anti-Graffiti Network, we just started drawing and painting. You know, I really wasn't sure at the time. You know, I mean, I knew the graffiti writers liked art. We couldn't use spray paint. So that was off the table. That came from the mayor. So we had to do other things. So we just started out, you know, drawing and painting. That went over well. Then we built in printmaking. Then we started um, a few years later, we took uh, the kids to hear poetry. I remember we went to the free library and Sonia Sanchez was reading and how life-changing that was. And so over time, it was very incremental though, we started building in more things. So you might just wanna, you know, just, just start out with one thing and just see how that goes. But I always feel like to being informed and I'm like a sponge. I'm always soaking up other people's practices and what they're doing and reading about other things and, um, you know, volunteer, just, just see how other people are doing it. And then just a subtle introduction and then build on that. Yeah. I've found one of the things is that, uh, and I look at it in a couple a couple ways. One is uh, how do you introduce it in terms of work with your clients, but the other is how do you uh, uh, get people in the helping professions uh, to uh, uh, use arts in, in their practice. Some think, well, that's not me. And I, I used to teach, uh, you know, courses like crisis intervention, group treatment, family work. And, uh, you know, at first I would teach crisis intervention. I'd say, okay, what we're going to do is create a group poem on crisis. And that put them into crisis automatically. You know, poem. Uh, it, it's, it's just, uh, but you, you show them how this is uh, something that is, uh, that you could do. Uh, and so I would 
practice with you know them using a creating a group home you know each person contributes a line to what crisis is and uh, and then it always you know in my view everything starts with with well with me it starts with me first if i'm going to use it first try it out on yourself you know see how that how that works and and, and what are the pros and uh, cons of that and because uh, i never force anyone to do anything uh, so that would be like one example of how I would try and get people. And what's been really gratifying is, you know, you know, years later, I'll get people from, uh, you know, alums, uh, always love to hear from students who, or have questions who are using it and using it better than I am. Uh, uh, and so that's one piece. I would also add like engaging your own creative forms of, of play as well, too. Um, oftentimes we think that creativity and play is just for kids, just for teenagers. It's for all of us. It's connected with our humanity. Um, it's important for us to, we're interested in introducing something to clients, try it out, play around with it, um, learn the ins and outs, uh, figure out, you know, what feelings came up for you when you started using this medium. I use, um, I told you all at the beginning that I, I like to create a lot of different um, materials. One of my favorite materials is alcohol ink. It can give you a lot of anxiety because you have something in mind about what you want to create. And then you go to drip the ink on the paper and then does whatever it wants to do. <laughs> so because, because I've played with it, when I introduce it to a client, I can also say, all right, here's some feelings that came up for me may come up for you too, may not, uh, but this is how this works. Um, let's kind of learn learn this together. Um, if you're interested in uh, learning how to help clients create videos, uh, take a look at YouTube videos about how you can use, you know, I've, I've made a ton of videos with clients using, um, using iMovie. Look at some tutorials, try something out. Um, I have a I have an Instagram page for my dog and I was able to play around with how to how to um create reels in a way that I liked. Um not anything that had, you know, confidential client information about trauma, but it gave me an opportunity to be able to practice um you know so that I could then talk to clients about the ins and outs of that particular medium. Um the other thing I would say uh, to piggyback of, off of what Jane mentioned is the, the relationship building. Um, it is so incredibly important for us to, excuse me, I'm going to sneeze. Sorry, it went away. Okay. Um, it's so incredibly important for us to build relationships with other people. Um, we talk about the importance of the relationship all throughout social work practice, but we don't always talk about it. We talk about it in relationship to like us as, as practitioners and clients, but we don't talk about it a ton as it relates to uh, our community partners. Um, there are people that are doing incredible, cool, amazing, innovative things, and we're just not talking to each other. And sometimes we're working with the same po client populations and that other person is using this innovative tool and we don't even know anything about it because we haven't built that relationship. So I would encourage you all, you're interested in, in a particular practice, um, go on the website. You know, you you read a book, and you love what the author had to say, flip the book over. Usually there's contact information. There's an email address. Not everybody is going to have time to reach out to you, but some people will. Um, I have had more like random Panera um, conversations at lunchtime <laughs> um, than I can even count. And those conversations, had I had no idea where those conversations were, were going to lead other than I just wanted to build a relationship with this particular organization because they're doing cool things. And I have to tell you all, just starting off from, you know, someone sending me an email, me sending someone else an email saying, hey, you know, it's really cool what you're doing. Uh, would you like to meet up? I can share what I do. You can share what you do. You have no idea where those relationships, where those connections are going to take you. Um it may seem at first like, okay, where is this going? I don't have a clear agenda for the direction. Those relationships are going to become incredibly valuable, important. Um, you might not know where to take the relationship initially, but then, you know, because you built that relationship, something comes along and they're like, oh, I know a social worker who does this or that. I know a counselor who does this. I know an artist who does that. And then you're able to, you know, develop a viable partnership with each other. Megan, once again, I have to keep agreeing with you. That's just so 
so important in every little way that you could uh, uh, build those relationships. And it comes, you know, uh, and, you know, there's obvious, like for me, it's obvious our poetry therapy organization, really people have very close relationship, more like family. And, and th then it goes beyond that because, you you know, we all get emails and, and I've always made a point, no matter what, always respond to an email inquiry. Don't, don't ever let, uh, let that go. Uh, and some, you may do something, they may forget to say thank you, but so what? Uh, but, you know, what, you know, I wish they would so I can keep uh, talking with them, but uh, that's, uh, uh, it, it comes in almost serendipitous ways. And again, very quick example was, uh, uh, I've got an, uh, an email uh, through, and actually it's through our poetry therapy organization, a colleague of mine, through uh, uh, two colleagues of mine, who uh, got an email from a poet in Ukraine. And, uh, uh, you know, so we start to communicate and you know, try to you know, provide some support. And of course, I, you know, again, we learn as, as we give. And uh, I consider that like an honor and you build relationships. So we have, uh, and again, I, I know I'm not alone, uh, poetry therapy, we have or contacts across the world. So you have someone from Korea, someone from the Netherlands, it, it's, it's, which is, and, and hopefully that builds that, that you, we keep learning. I, I just think that's the, been one of the, one of the great, uh, great things. That's yeah. Amazing. And I just want to say experiment too. Don't be afraid to try things. You yes. know, when, um, there was a spike in, people grappling with housing and security in the city. This is probably when John Street was mayor. They opened up places. They called them cafes. They were really, it was like a gathering place where people could get a shower and some hot coffee. Yeah. And the city asked us to, to do something. And we went to a woman who was a weaver. And so she would show up every Tuesday and Thursday morning with her loom. And, you know, within a few months, it became super popular. And I was like, well, who, I first I thought, okay, we'll try this. What could this really work? But it did. And that led us to do other things as well. So, so, you know, be curious, be brave, jump in, experiment. Mm -hmm. So let's go to this next um, set of questions. How do we distinguish between therapeutic and therapy? And what professional boundaries should we keep in mind as we incorporate the arts into our practice? Any thought, initial thoughts? Uh, well, I, I can start off. Okay, you okay, yeah, start. You're, you're start. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so on the one hand, um, those of us who practice as clinicians have a specific skill set that we should be proud of, right? Like we got all these degrees. We have student loans at the wazoo. Like this is our area of specialty. We learned about it. Um, we love it. We're passionate about it. Um, then I think on the other hand, it's also important for us to recognize that we are not the only ones who are providing valid, powerful, transformative support to marginalized populations and populations who and or populations who've experienced trauma. There's enough space for all of us. Now, what that space looks like, um, I'm not an art, I'm not an art therapist. I'm a social worker who uses the arts. I'm not a music therapist. I'm a social worker who uses music therapeutically. I have a clear understanding of what my role is. Um, I follow social work eth ethics and values. That's what guides uh, my use of these different creative methods. However, I also partner with a lot of people who don't even necessarily have um, a graduate degree. And it is important for all of us to figure out ways to share space with one another. I actually um, uh, wrote an article along with a colleague who's a psychiatrist and another colleague who's an art therapist. And we were exploring this because each of us has our own professional values, ethics, approaches, but then many of us are working with some clients who have similar needs. How can we also understand, how can we understand who we are professionally while we are also working in a collegial, collaborative way with other people? The other thing I want to point out is, although it is great for us to be proud of our professional degrees and our credentials, all those long, long lists of acronyms that we put behind our names, it is also incredibly important for us to demonstrate respect for everybody. Um, there are uh, some people who do not have the same, you know, graduate degrees 
who are doing just, just as amazing of a job providing support to marginalized communities. And it's important for us to make space for that and to, to have respect for that. Um, so there, there's a theorist named Winnicott. He developed uh, object really, one of the founders of object relations theory. And he was like uh, a consultant for kids during the time of World War II when they were getting evacuated from London to the countryside to stay safe from for the bombings. And he was a therapist. He was an innovative therapist for his time. And uh, something that he said, so he was called to a group home to be providing the therapy and to be consulting with all these kids who got displaced. And something he said, he said uh, that he learned really quickly that it wasn't him that was doing the therapy. It was the regularity of the meals. It was the brightly colored bedspreads. It was the discipline. It was the boundaries. Um, so I think that's something that's important to remember too. Like our our non quote unquote credential people doing therapy. Um, it's arguable. <laughs> um, are they using the particular theories that you know a graduate student would use? Not necessarily, but um, are they helping people heal? Are they helping people recover? Are they providing a sense of safety? Because isn't that what what therapy and therapeutic is all about? So how do we make space for all of us here, um, recognizing our roles? Part of what I wanted to to, to add to that is that uh, is that you may be, for example, you may be an educator who what you're doing, you recognize it has a therapeutic impact, but you're not doing therapy. Uh, then you might be a therapist who uh, is doing therapy, recognize there's an educational component. So just at my concern, and I, I agree, some of the best things that are done are done by non-professionals. But again, a good professional will realize, take advantage of, of, of those who uh, can be uh, can be uh, can be helpful, but I do think it's important uh, for legal and ethical reasons. And I think you were starting at it, Meg. Is that uh, you've got to stay within your own professional boundaries. And if you know that, you'll think of you know the boundaries for social work, for education, for psychology, and so that you're, for example, a social worker who is using. Uh, uh, arts techniques. You're not claiming to be an art therapist. You're not claiming to be a, a, a music therapist, a poet. I, I, that's perfectly legit. On the other hand, there are some people who may identify as poetry therapist or music therapist. Now, poetry is the new kid on the block, but you know, music therapy has degrees and very and art therapy, uh, strict credentials for that. So before you call yourself an art therapist, you have to meet those, uh, uh, those standards. Uh, uh, so anyway, that's, that's, uh, in poetry therapy, we do have credentialing uh, for, but it's not licensing, uh, so it does help you identify. Uh, so again, it's not meant to be uh, you know, snobby or anything like that. It's it's just down to uh, a very basic point about ethics and legality, not to not to do something that, uh, uh, which I think we all know. It's it's just part of that. And I think you know just. Be aware and of of who you're working with and the seriousness of it. Like, let I'll talk about the Kensington storefront. So when we opened the storefront, it was like, okay, we're going to open a place in Kensington uh, and we're going to offer art. And thankfully, we partnered with the Department of Behavioral Health because it it made us smarter. And it was like, oh, soon we realized hundreds of people were coming through who were seriously sort of had se very serious issues with drugs and were in various, some of them maybe in recovery, some in active addiction, some in maybe thinking about like your recovery, but it was, we had these peer, peer specialists. We um, had uh, some clinicians. We had visiting nurses from Drexel. We, we built a real uh, sort of cohort of experts of, of different levels. So you had everyone from artists, who never had taken a social work class to people who had extensive training in this area. And I think it was, we, we had Narcan training, we had CPR training. We, you know, so it's sort of like, try to figure out what are the needs and how do you build a village of people who can address those needs and just be mindful. We were mindful. And, and Dr. Nick, thanks for what you said, because I think that it was very important for us to know where we were sort of over our 
pay grade, where it was like over our pay grade, like, whoa, this is really not, you know, something we shouldn't be doing. This is some, this, this is an area where we could be doing what we could be doing. But I think like our, the director of our portrait program, Nadia Malik is an MSW. So she brings a lot of skill to the table, uh, which is really invaluable because I don't have that degree, right? I don't have the experience that Nadia has. So she's seasoned in a way that is, is really helpful and thoughtful and cautious and always looking out for the individual. And honestly, it's what Megan said. I mean, we all learn from each other too. So in some ways one could say, you know, the art itself is as therapeutic as almost anything else, right? But when you're able to work side by side with your colleagues who know something you don't know, you're able to provide this sort of a much more comprehensive sort of experience and a healing, a situation that allows for healing in a way that maybe you couldn't do it alone. So it's sort of being aware and being open and being open to what you don't know. Yeah, it's. Uh, I think one of the key words is uh, that I think we all agree on that is the is the benefits of uh, interdisciplinary work is that there's no one, uh, uh, and so that that's my favorite. I like to kind of think in that perspective. And there was just a, a, a you know we talk about uh, one caution. I, I recall uh, Jerome Frank, who is a social psychologist, wrote a book on persuasion and healing, and he, this, this always stuck with me. He says, anything that has the power to heal has the power to harm. Uh, and so, for example, if I'm using poetry and, and I'm not anticipating, the I might bring up something the client is not ready to deal with. And so you have to just keep that, uh, you know, uh, keep that in mind and be prepared uh, to, to, to deal with that. Absolutely. And I think um, I also want to add just as we build relationships, how do we know our scope of practice and work within our scope of practice while also all of us humbling ourselves and also recognizing if and when we are being territorial um, so that we're engaging in self-reflection to say, you know what, we're all in this together. We have the same goal. We want people to, to recover, to heal, to bounce back and also like demonstrating mutual respect, um, respect for everyone. Um, I was just talking to students about this um, in the context of our, our um, school uh, social work certificate program. And I was saying, we talk about the relationship building. That also includes um, people who clean up the school. That involves administrative assistance. That involves teachers, parents. Like, how do we also take that, the same skills that we use in building relationships with clients and showing respect to clients? How do we also do the same across all of um across all of these different organizations um, and partnering professionals as well, or paraprofessionals or community members. Um, if you have the relationship, you have everything. If you don't have the relationship, you don't have anything at all. So let's segue into our Q&A um, period. So I'm gonna stop sharing the screen for now and I'm going to pull up some questions. It looks like we have some comments um, so, uh, Jane, someone said they've been part of Mural Arts as a representative of CareerLink staff from Suburban Station. Um, and then, yeah, we have another couple comments about how the arts allow for non-judgmental expression and creativity. So here's a question um, for Jane and Nick. How have you maintained your energy and enthusiasm in the field for so long? <laughs> uh a <laughs> good question. I uh, uh, well, it's something I I mean I like I do, and it, it's just uh, uh, it's um, and it's really the purple the yeah, the purple uh, the uh, the I think you had mentioned that before was you know the relationship you you, you build and uh, uh, with with others, and this again goes everything from colleagues. Uh, uh, to to students, I thought what I miss most about retiring, I still try and stay active, is being involved with students because uh, uh, we all keep learning. And so it's something that's meaningful uh, 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 to me. I mean, you know, I'd be lying if I said there aren't days I go, whoa, <laughs> maybe I've taken on too, you know, too much. But uh, uh, I'm I'm committed to the journal uh, of, of poetry therapy because I feel that's that's important, and I like I like doing it, and obviously the organization. Uh, but 
Um, it's a tough one to answer. It's just I just keep doing. And the other thing, I probably when I was introducing myself, uh, the one thing I forgot to mention was first and foremost is uh, being a father and being a and being a grandfather and and, and those kinds of, uh, of 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 things that you know in terms of family because uh, you know above all we're a person uh, have a personal life and uh, and there are things I've done that. Uh, um, uh, are meaningful to me and, and meaningful to them in, in, in different ways. And and one of the things uh, that was traumatic for me uh, was uh, 2005 uh, when my son was killed and in a, in a, died in a car car accident. And uh, and so uh, I mean that's something you never get over. But you and, and people they they say things they don't you know that aren't helpful, but it's well intended. Uh, but it's a matter of uh, trying to do symbolic and do things in writing and, and little activities that, that uh, honor his memory. And so that becomes part of it. So even some of the things that are uh, painful and difficult, uh, it uh, keeps me going. So I always, uh, uh, and, and the other thing is I'm a runner. I'm, I'm not as fast as I used to be, but uh, I'm not fast at all, as a matter of fact. But I that that used to keep me going because I used to, uh, and, and again, in my book, I, I did different chapters on on uh you know what's meaningful and i did one on the personal uh a, a part so to me uh running is poetry uh it, it's just that that's that's part of it uh so uh and i still do it again i'm, I'm still uh you know my, my days of uh ultra marathons are gone but uh it, it's uh, uh and it's, it's having you know my daughter and when he, my son when he was alive at the finish line that's the best poetry of all Mm, that's nice, Dr. Nick. Well, I think for me, it's, you know, every week, I mean, it's look, it's, it's, we have a staff of almost 60 people, hundreds of artists on contract work with some of the most vulnerable citizens of our city. I mean, it's complicated work. I mean, there's no doubt. And sometimes it feels pretty overwhelming and daunting, but I would say every week something happens that is truly inspiring. You know, you you get to see the impact of a mural or you go down and thank you for whoever wrote that comment about um, Color Me Back at Suburban Station. Like you go, you know, and you talk to constituents or, you know, like this weekend we were in Detroit at a, a convening, a street art mural convening. And, you know, people, strangers came up to me from around the country and just said, thank you. You know, thanks to mural arts, I've honed my own practice. We have a program in our city. And, you know, and so it the work we try to make the work generative. So something leads to something else and something else. And the second thing is, I think my teaching, I teach at Penn and I teach at the Maryland Institute College of Art uh, in their graduate program. And that's really fulfilling too, because you feel in some way that the work is like planting seeds and the seeds take root. And then you see people and, you know, flourish. And that's, that's you know, really inspiring. Um, this question is for you, Jane. With mural arts, how do you gather a community's feedback or data before? Oh, it went it went away before and after the mural um, is is installed. Well, before a mural is installed, we have uh, community meetings. We try to do an audit, like what makes a community. Like you know, it's very hard. Sometimes it's a two square blocks, five square blocks. We meet with the community, talk to the rec center the local community leaders, the school businesses. We try to talk to any of the civic leaders or political leaders in the area. And usually, you know, if there are pre-existing meetings, we'll join in and ask people what they're thinking. You know, murals, one way that murals happen, they happen a number of different ways, but one is that we have a, um, a community mural application. So anybody in the city can apply for a mural and you make your case. And then let's say, you know, we say, oh, that's a very interesting application. So people sometimes have an idea, but we have to vet it with a broader community. And sometimes people don't have an idea and just say, we have a site and we'd love it to be beautified and please come, you know, talk to our neighbors. So we go through a process. Sometimes murals happen, they're connected to our departments, in which case it's often about like criminal justice reform or education or community development or, you know, the porch lay program. So, but there's always a community. There's never not a community. If you're doing it in a school, the school's the community, they're in charge, right? So, so and you have to then build a bridge between the artist and the community. You have to like remind the artist, this is a public art commission. You've got to like pay attention to what the community thinks. We don't want your work micromanaged. It's not art by committee, but you've got to listen deeply. And to the community, to the community, we say, look, um, you're going to say a lot, 
Some things, nothing will be taken literally, but just think of it that you are psychologically, socially, civically, in you're influencing the look of what this mural is. And so you get all parties to sort of have a, it's almost like a, a, a social compact that they, they're reaching together to create a beautiful work of art. And then afterwards, your, your question is actually really good. I don't think we're that good at the aftermath coming back and evaluating the impact. We evaluate the impact of Porchlight, Art Ed, and our criminal legal, the work with the criminal legal system, like we're measuring recidivism and jobs and all that stuff. We don't often go back into the community and ask what people think. However, through the Yale School of Medicine, we evaluated our porch light work for four years. And that included evaluating the impact of the work. And what the evaluators found was that there was something they called collective efficacy. And that is that people felt that they were ready for change in a positive way after the completion of a work of public art. And that was really interesting to see. That's good. We're gonna try to squeeze in two more questions before we wrap up. So one of them is if someone would want to learn more about stories or about poetry therapy, is there like a specific programs um, to help them? So I can speak to the stories part. Um, Could you repeat the question one more time? I have a hearing impairment, I'm sorry. Yeah, so for those people who are interested in learning more about stories and learning about poetry therapy, how would they go about doing that? Um, so uh, as far as stories trainings go, I offer, um, me and my my business stories offer um, different trainings, virtual in person. Um, and you can find out more information about those trainings by visiting um, the website. It's stories, S-T-O-R-I-E-Z, guide g-u-i-d-e dot com and it will give you information about all the different trainings that are offered and then dr nick um can you speak to the poetry therapy training sure. uh one of the things that you can do there's a separate organization it's called the uh international federation of biblio poetry therapy and uh, you could find that the link if you could actually if you just go to the poetry therapy uh, website. It's listed under uh, resources, or you could just, uh, uh, you know, Google it. But it's the, they they are a separate organization. It does the credentialing, but they offer the training. They can put you in touch with people who could mentor you. Uh, if if that's do I have the question right in, in terms of that? Uh, uh, so that's a formal, uh, you know, way to do it. Uh, and then other ways, you you just maybe connect with people who may want to work with you uh, uh, informally. Uh, so that's. Uh, does that answer the question? I guess, I guess. Okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> and then I'm, this question, I'm always uncertain. <laughs> it's all right. And then this question, we could talk about this one for a while. How do these types of therapy or interventions differ from art therapy? When we work with art therapists, how do we use this different or complementary? I'll chime in first on this one. So I would encourage you all, um, me and my colleagues, um, uh, Denise Wolf and Linda Bills just published, it's just like almost hot off the presses from last year, created a really cool, well, I think it's cool, um, article. It's called Trauma Triptych. And if you put in like Trauma Triptych and then put in my last name, the article should come up. It's called Trauma Triptych, Inviting Cross-Disciplinary Collaboration in Art Therapy, Social Work, and Psychiatry. So when we're looking at all of the different um, expressive art all of the different degree and licensure programs that involve the expressive arts. There are specific credentials, specific um, training um, that people go through in order to be able to call themselves an art therapist, a dance and movement therapist, a music therapist. Um, so it part of what we were trying to explore in that article is um, what is our scope of practice as we use the arts? I use the arts as a social worker. Denise uses the arts as an art therapist. Um, Lindra uses the arts as a psychiatrist. Um, how do we understand our scope of practice? How do we uniquely use um, arts-based interventions based off of our specific training? Also, how do we increase collaboration? And also even know like when, 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 uh, when to refer to a professional who does have those particular credentials. So the same way that a social work program would have um, how we have, you know, particular competencies, interventions that we work on, um, ethics, processes, 
Um, that's the same thing that an art therapist or a music therapist, a dance and movement therapist will go would would experience or would um would use and think through. Now it's tricky because I'm gonna say something that's a little controversial. The arts <laughs> that's people, okay. The arts belong to humans. The arts belong to humanity. The arts don't belong to any particular profession. Just like as social workers. We value the human relationship. Social workers don't own relationships. Um, we don't own connections. Now, are we trained and qualified to be able to capitalize on that power in a particular specific way that other professionals have not learned? Yes. So it's also important for us to think about that Um I'm never calling myself an art therapist because I'm not. I'm not calling myself a music therapist. But because the arts belong to humanity, how can I take my particular ethics, my scope of practice, what I'm trained to do as a social worker, and use these as a tool? And then also, how do I know and how can I assess when I'm in over my head and, and a referral needs to take place because I can't assess somebody's trauma history based off of the way that they move um, you know, during a session. Um, I can't conduct an, an, uh, an arts-based assessment to determine what somebody's mental health symptoms are, but I can use the arts in my, from my social work vantage point. Couldn't agree with you more. I mean, Me I mean, too. That's just, okay. Or you know what? I hate to barrel in with my big face and my square, <laughs> but we have a post test to take. And I know folks um, are here until eight o'clock. 